over the years, I've been doing this for 23 years now, and um, I've, you know, we've all been on stage with our groups and something didn't go right. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you when my aha moment was, when I started to approach things a little differently. I was at Plymouth Canton, and it was um, State Band Festival. We were playing the Hinnemouth Symphony. Um, and we got to the third movement, the fugue. Um, and if you, if you're, are you familiar with the third movement? There's that transition in the woodwinds. Before it recaps back into the main fugue theme, and he starts to layer the, the ideas. And um, we got on stage, and, and that just didn't go well. That was a scary transition for us. Um, it was really scary. And when we finished, we, we were covered. But when we finished, and we were walking to sight reading, I realized that was the first time that we had ever run the entire third movement, was the performance on stage at State Band Festival. And I realized I did not set my students up for, for success. That was my fault. That wasn't their fault. We had worked that transition numerous times in rehearsal, but not in context. And um, that was my fault. So I started approaching things a little differently, and, and I, I still continue to do so. Um, but that's sort of what, when I was talking with Gary about this, this particular subject that we discussed um, in Cobb County at an in-service, um, you know, it's, it's something I think that we all need to step back once in a while and remind ourselves of. So um, in the little outline, the, the first thing, this, and in your folder, um, I included the handouts for the, I, I do a fundamental session a lot of the times um, at this event. I didn't this year, but I wanted it, it, it's interrelated, so I wanted to at least include that material. And this little chart where it says suggested structure of daily rehearsals through the year. Um, this is sort of how, how my mind works um, when I'm, I'm pacing things out and planning things out. So, a, consider the year in quarters or concert cycles. So if you, if you look at the columns where it's 100, 0, 80, 20, 70, 30, et cetera, that first column would be the October concert event. Okay? The second column where it's 80, 20, 70, 30, that's the December concert event. The third column is the f festival event. For us, it's called LGPE and it's in, in mid-March. And then the final column is uh, the May concert. So I sort of think about, and some, you know, if you've got a program that gives five concerts, you'd have five columns, you know, that, that type of thing. But, um, and we usually have more than four concerts, but these are the biggies. And, and so I, I structured this chart this way. And if you read it, it says, consider the year and quarters and establish a minimum, minimum, very important. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute when, when we talk about some lesson plans from, from my band a minimum ratio of unison etude work versus literature. I'm, I'm a firm believer um, that developing skill sets in our students is, it's more efficiently done through unison etudes. So even, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm exclusively high school right now, but my, my third band has a set of etude books, two, three sets of etude books that we use on a, a daily basis. Um, second band, set of three different books. The top band, a set of three different books um, that we use. <clears throat> and to me, I'm a trombonist. I used to be a trombonist, as I said. And um, there's not a lot of literature other than some Sousa marches and maybe Rolling Thunder, you know, some marches. There's not a lot of stuff that develops trombone technique in the literature. And if a kid's not taking private lessons, and you know, let's face it, most the majority of our students don't take private lessons, you know, even in Cobb County. You know, the top bands, it might be 50%, 60% of kids take, take private lessons. So you know, we have to structure our rehearsals in a way that we can reach those kids who don't take private lessons and, and sort of make it a group private lesson for a portion of our rehearsal. If you don't, if you just do a scale and tune and go into the literature, 
you're developing very different skill sets in each section. You know, one piece of literature might be working lots of sixteenths and the flutes and the clarinets and the trombones and the euphoniums and the tubas are playing lots of whole notes and half notes and, and so on. So if you, if you have a unison etude where you can develop the technique that's necessary in the concert literature, um, you can make sure that your entire band is developing the same skill sets. Then you can put any piece of music in front of them that you want and you know they'll be able to, to handle it. Okay, so um, the ratios, you know, in sixth grade, the first quarter of the year, you're going to be using an etude book 100% of the time, right? Um, so it's 100 and zero. You, you know, in the second concert and in December, you know, that you might hand out their first piece of sheet music where, where it's, it's got independence of parts. So it's more 80% etude book and you're spending 20% of your rehearsals um, and so on. You know, what I'm going to focus on today is the, the grade 12. Um, so I'm going to talk about sort of how I would structure the wind symphony class. But the, the concepts, grade 6 through grade 12, should be no different in how you pace, I believe. Um, it's just you're pacing with different level challenges, if that makes sense. I say minimum because if you look at that grade 12, 40, 60, 40, 60, 30, 70, that's not my reality. I think that's what you should at least strive to do. My reality when we get into this is um, even in the LGPE cycle where it says 30, 70, we're usually at about 50, 50 at the, at the beginning of this cycle. Now, this will shift. It says ratios within each quarter evolve gradually toward the literature, right? So when I'm introducing the literature in the beginning of a concert cycle, I'm spending 50% of my time on fundamental exercises, 50% of my time on the introduction of the literature. As you progress toward the concert, like two weeks before the concert, you're not 50-50 anymore. You're more 20-80. Does that make sense? Um, <clears throat> and then the final quarter reveals student level of mastery and understanding because you spend less time on the fundamentals um, and you get to see what have they really learned and what can they apply without all that extra etude time. For us, what, what we do um, in my program um, in a typical year is from January through mid-March when we have LGPE, we've, we've got a 90-minute block where the kids meet every day. And then Tuesdays are sectional day and Thursdays are sectional day. So each section in my wind symphony um, has a one and a half hour sectional block for those two and a half months, once a week. So the flutes are there once a week for an hour and a half, the clarinets are there once in a week for an hour and a half, and so on. Um, so I'm at the school until about 10 o'clock at night on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, and I build in a little half hour break where I can run to a drive through and grab something to eat. But I teach those, those sectionals because I'm a control freak. And, I, I, and it's the funnest teaching I do. It's where you get to know the kids. It can be a more relaxed atmosphere. Um, you're not in front of 70 kids. You're in front of a maximum of maybe 12 or 14. And it's, it just, it, it's where you get to know each other and where you really get to know them as individual players. Um, but then we stop the sectionals after LGPE, and we start doing jazz ensemble and spring musical and different things. But I still hand out as challenging, if not more so challenging, literature for the May concert. And I tell them, you know, now, now you've got to do at home what we did the last two and a half months in sectionals. You have to be that disciplined in your practice. And it's about establishing the pattern of good practice, if that, if that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> so it takes us to the introduction of literature. I, I, I said down here macro to micro, to macro again, the bow tie. So for me, let's imagine that we're in a 10 or a 12 week concert cycle. It's gonna look like this. Let's imagine it's more even, but, but um, at the beginning, it's, it's macro. And what I mean by that is um, on the literature, um, the first couple weeks, and this, this takes me back to that Hindemith Symphony uh, experience. I'm going to run the whole piece by the end of two weeks. It might not be up to tempo, 
but the kids need to understand the, the big picture roadmap of the piece before we really start to dig in. Okay? So <clears throat> that's what I mean by macro. Understand that we're still spending 50% of the time, at least, on the fundamentals within that rehearsal. But when it comes to the literature, we're trying to just do big picture work. I'm going to reserve the detailing for later. Um, I vowed never again am I going to get on stage and have that be the first time that my kids run a piece <laughs> of, of music. Um, so <clears throat> it says macro rehearsal should focus on the big picture. We're talking literature now. Avoid bogging down. I, I'm terrible at this. I still am terrible at this. And I think most of us are wired. We want it to be right. And um, it's so easy to, it takes tremendous discipline to, in the initial introduction of the literature, not try to make it perfect. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I used to, I mean, I'd introduce the first 40 bars of a piece. And, and we'd spend a couple days on that. We'd start to make it sound pretty good. And we'd go to the next 40 bars of the piece. And, we, you know, and, and I did micro from the very beginning. And the overall performance result was never as high as, as what it is now when I, I think this way with the kids. Um, so I, you know, reserve the detailing for the fundamental time. So for instance, we, we played at, um, well, I'll talk about what's in the lesson plans. The lesson plans in here from two years ago. So two years ago, when we were doing our, our festival preparation, we, we performed, um, we opened with uh, Gordon Jacobs' March from the original suite. Then we played Ron Nelson's Lauds. No, then we played Hammersmith, I'm sorry, by Holst. Then we played Ron Nelson's Lauds. Um, so, for instance, Hammersmith has you know, a lot of really chopsy 6-8 stuff, 16th notes uh, on top of each other with, with the, the winds. Um, and I didn't worry about detailing that in the literature, but I was doing etudes in 6-8 and etudes with 16th notes, and I was detailing that because it was with a full band, and I could develop the stylistic understanding and the fundamental um, aspects of performance that were necessary to play Hammersmith much more efficiently from a time standpoint in the etudes. Um, so when I say reserve the detailing for the fundamental time, that's what I mean. Is, is um, The etude work is where we got that done. It says this time is more about the introduction than the refinement on the literature. Um, coordinate the fundamental exercises to match the literature needs. And when we get to the lesson plan, um, Hammersmith, do you all, all, all know Hammersmith? Um, you know, it starts with that rolling river theme. The that just ascends from the tubas into the euphoniums and back down. And it's, they do it forever at Pianissimo. And it's not supposed to have dynamic shape and contrasts. Well, there was an etude in this book. I referenced this book yesterday. It's my, it's my favorite book. Um, this Symphonic Band Techniques, where what I spent time refining was flexibility and slur studies. So the whole band was playing it, even though it was mainly the low brass that had it in the literature. It's very valuable for the woodwinds and the trumpets to have that kind of control. So the full band would be practicing. Um, That was an etude that we worked on daily with the metronome set. And I'd just walk around the ensemble. And if, the, if there was interruption to their, 
their sound and it was a finger issue where their fingers weren't m moving fast enough, I, I, you know, you've got you've to be crisper with your finger motion. Or if it was a tension issue, you know. And every day they were getting individual attention on what they needed to do to develop the skill set to play it within Hammersmith. And then, like I said, you know, you've got all those woodwinds, you know, in, in the, the middle section where it starts to go crazy. Well, my trombones were playing an etude, because they didn't have it, but I wanted them to have that skill set. Because then, you know, you can hand out a Variations on America, and they, they've got it. You know, so it, it's um, the refinement and the detail work you can do so much more efficiently with this. And, and I, would, I always find etudes that have the, the, the pedagogical demands that you find in the literature that you can work on with the full band, if that makes, if that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> Ah, this was asked, and now I'm going to mispronounce it. I'm going to just, it's Tom Rhodes, R-H-O-D-E-S, and Donald, I'm not going to attempt to pronounce this last name. It's spelled B, as in boy, I-E-R-S-C-H-E-N-K. And it's Southern Music Company. Um, and it's just a tremendous resource. It, it's, it takes you through everything. I mean, anything that you will find in literature, somewhere there's an etude <laughs> that, that you can apply those concepts. It's just, yep, yep. Although there are, you know, it starts with, um, it starts with chord sequences and then chorales and then balance builders where it's in four-part harmony and different voicings and you can have them switch lines. So you can put your low brass on the, the primary melody on A and your flutes on the lower harmony D and still work on balance. Um, and it's, it's just, it's a brilliant book. It, it truly is. Um, 